true boy for you. They were saying, God gets my goat. <laughs> if you had become this videographer of, for weddings, I mean, how different would your life be now? Would there be a show that we've got? I mean, and how bad do you kick yourself about that? Oh, and the whole, before all, you answer all of those many intimate questions that you shouldn't be answering on the air. The point I was going to make is if that was, that's the obligation, that's your job, how much would you enjoy doing that editing thing? And would you have burned out by now? I might be. I, the, the thing about wedding videos is and everybody that I know, I mean, I, I work with all sorts of video type people and pretty much all of them stay away from wedding videos on purpose. And it's because of that thing that you were talking about where it's the pinnacle of a woman's life somehow. This day, it's all led up to this day. And once the day is over, then you know, nothing else matters. It's it's done. Or I don't know what it is, but they have reality shows about these people, these bridezillas, I think they call them or something like that. You never know when you're going to wind up with one of those people that is just going to freak out if the smallest thing goes wrong in the video. If you missed something. I know somebody, and this was in California before I came here, this guy had the pastor come in and ADR some of the lines from the wedding. Some of the stuff that he said. He had him redo the lines on a nice mic because he didn't get a good recording on it. And this was just somebody that worked in TV already. He, he did this just for his own wedding. He actually had the guy come in and re-say it so it would be perfect. I mean, that's the kind of stuff that you can be up against. When you're doing wedding videos. I mean, I think it's really cool. Wedding videos in general. It's one of those things where and nobody else wants to see them. Like it's basically just for husband and wife and nobody else wants to see them. And then after you break up, yeah, you yeah. watch it whilst drinking. Yeah, even <laughs> that's the worst. I did a wedding video for my nephew and I think it took me forever to ever get around to him. By the time I had it done, like he was already... Uh, broken up from his wife and he's just like I don't want to watch that stupid thing and I was just like oh but but you still must pay me it's, it's so good I spent all this time <laughs> it's like, and it's look awesome. how much you were in love then look at how great it is I don't look care if you don't like she her once anymore was. but uh, you know it, I, the whole concept of it and you know sitting down with your wife and you know on your anniversary or you know whatever five years later or just some time when you want to butter her up so she'll actually say yes to you that night. You know, sit down and watch that wedding video and remember that, hey, there was that one day and it was always so great and look at how young and happy and smiley and, you know, in love we were and we can recapture that for another night. And now look at you. <laughs> Told you not to listen to that gets my goat. I, I like that concept and being able to create something that is like that and that you can watch and, and feel that way again. But there's too many possible things that would, can go wrong. And the last thing, the last thing that I would ever want to do is have to go to some kind of a friggin' court because people sue the wedding video guy if he didn't get everything right sometimes. Go to court. Okay, over, so over okay, so. a frickin' wedding video. So I my perception is totally wrong. That is just some guy with a video camera recording oh, it. And it used to be. An Alison Krauss and Union Station song underneath it looped. And then he'd <laughs> give him the. I, I, I even see it as on a video cassette at the end. <laughs> see, that's why you're thinking of ones that were given to people on a video cassette. It has evolved way beyond that. And at the time that I got this computer, I was not prepared really for all that it took because I needed. A, a new camera that would have cost me several thousand dollars as well and i had you know at, at the time it was new but i should uh, if i wanted to compete i had to be putting out hd videos on dvd and stuff for people which i thought oh no i've got a camera i can handle that you know the camera will be fine but it was making square video and it was already to the point where people didn't want that anymore and uh it's a bigger investment than you think. And yeah, you got to have everything exactly right or else 
people will freak out. You know, if you don't get every last one of their vows, you know, every word that they said on their vows or whatever it is, you're going to have that person who's not just saying, oh, well, this is really good. I like it. Thank you. There's going to be one. And it seems like from the way that people are so afraid of doing wedding videos, it's got to be like one in 10 where you get somebody that's like that, where they're just monstrous to work with. And you'd rather slit your wrists than go and shoot another thing for them or edit something for them. And on top of it, it's gotten so competitive where like people expect, you know, you you, you have like a, a wedding in the morning or something and then a reception in the evening. And you have to have like a video made of the, the morning wedding by the reception that night that people will show at the reception kind of a thing. Why? Just because that's what people do now. See, I, I've seen people where they take buttloads of photographs and they do montages, and that's what's shown at the reception. And, uh, you know, I've always thought about that. And it's like, wow, we could do a really good job of that kind of thing. But wow. Yeah, it's insane. The stuff that people expect. And so to tell you the truth, I'm probably happier because I didn't actually do that than I would be if I had. I don't know. I mean, it's hard to say. I had a friend who was a insurance salesman. He worked for insurance. Ooh, the insurance chick is so hot. At one point, and he he said one time that some guy called him up and was insuring several really nice cars, and all the guy did for a living was wedding videos. And he's like, "Yeah, man, we because this and it would have been a good idea. See, if I'd actually done it with this guy, we probably would have succeeded because this guy has a business degree." This guy is a businessman. And he's like, yeah, I do. Well, me and you work together. Like, you make the videos and I'll get the clients and all this stuff. And I'm just like, God, I should have done that. Because that would the one chance that would have actually worked. See, that's my problem. I've and got the creative side, but I don't have the business side. What multimillionaire did he end up hooking up with after that? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I would have loved it. Maybe it would have been like, yeah, yeah, you get a couple bridezillas here and there. But for the most part, it's fun and exciting. And, and heck, I got these great cars out there that I have to insure because I make so much money doing this. I don't know. So I can't say whether I would be happier or not were I to have succeeded at being a wedding video maker. I think it's unlikely, but possible. Would there be a show? I would say it would be a different kind of show if we had a show. It would be a video show? It would be a video show. We'd have a YouTube channel where we made little videos. And that was something that I did a fair amount at the time. I would get my kids and I would write like little movies where they played, you know. I had one that was where they were ghosts or no i think they were the non-ghosts but they went trick-or-treating and then they ran into ghost children that wanted to go trick-or-treating with them and i shot that and never did get around to editing it although i actually had it 95 percent done when the computer crashed i've lost all that and i'll have to restart it someday but i've got a dvd of the work in progress really at some points yeah oh cool I don't have a DVD of the work in progress. Uh, and I did another one where uh, my son was in, and this was the time when he was four and my daughter was two and they were like, it was going to be a cereal, uh, like a like an old cereal from the 30s and they were like a Buck Rogers kind of space hero and they, they were fighting like, and I had all plans for like cheesy little monster costumes and they would fight the monsters every time and I even made up this awesome robot, <laughs> and he, I filmed him fight the robot, rip its head. Or I think what he does is he pulls the wires out or whatever, and then I had a smoke bomb that I put in, and the smoke came out from the robot. Somehow I'll have to use that. I unfortunately didn't get it all shot, and I think I had problems with the camera that day. So some of the video was ruined because it was all blocky and had those errors that you can get sometimes. But a lot of it was still useful. I could probably at least put together some kind of a trailer or something for it or maybe cobble together some kind of a story and just get a lot of narrator. I was actually going to have an announcer man and narrate that story. You can show it at his wedding <laughs> since that's when you'll get around. Yeah, it's about the time I finish it. But yeah, I mean, we would have done a lot of stuff like that. I think instead it would have been a lot of little videos and things like that that would probably have been on a YouTube channel. Those movies that you talked about where we're sho shoveling snow <laughs> and trying to one-up each other and 
with how great or awful our children are, those ones would have been videos instead of uh, audio dramas. Yeah, we probably would have done, just like Saturday Night Live, the same sketch over and over just (laughs) with one little thing switched out. But uh, yeah, that's probably the difference that the podcast would have had. We may have had none of the same people listening. I don't know how many of our podcast listeners are also subscribed to YouTube channels and watch them with frequency. Seems like that might be a different set of people. But uh, yeah, we still would have had something, I think. That's probably the difference that uh, things would have been. Was there any other questions that you asked? Do you remember? the? I, you said several of them. I don't recall uh, if there were more, if I've answered them all. Just if you wish that you had done that, if it's a big regret in your life. Not a big regret. I do sometimes regret not trying hard enough to make it happen. But it's just, you know, like I said, if I had that friend of mine that's the business guy, might have succeeded. But without him, I just don't have that personality. I'm not the person that will go out there and I don't even know what you do. Would you hand flyers out at wedding dress shops or, you know, tack things up on phone poles all over the place? I mean, how do you get the word out? Put your name in the phone book next to the 50 other people that do wedding videos or... I don't know. Do you probably have a wedding video YouTube channel? Yeah, a YouTube channel, have a website up. I had even plans where I had a couple guys at work that were going to do it with me and we had a name picked out and we had a we ha- I had a website. I used to send you emails that uh went to the website and the name of what our video company was going to be and uh yeah, we never did anything but get the website and get the email address. It's the farthest we ever got. I did finish up our, you know, example video. That one of my sister's, which I think is awesome. It's a totally rockin' wedding video, but it's as far as I ever went. My sister got a great video out of the deal, which she's probably lost the DVD to by now. (laughs) The comparison I can make is this uh, audiobook thing that I'm doing now. Right. Where there's, right now I think I have six contracts uh, That's way more than I ever got for wedding videos. <laughs> I hear you. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm hesitant to be frank about the process uh-huh. because, you know, you don't want to get a reputation of being an a-hole or, or you know, have one of these people And you can become, get that reputation really easy because you are an a-hole. Well, yeah, I don't want the truth <laughs> to come out. But, you know, there could be somebody that likes my voice or likes what I did. And so they say, oh, I'm going to seek out this guy's podcast. And then I'm complaining about the work I did for them. And that's that's kind of a jag off thing to do. But I've found that the quality of writing varies. But also the response that I get from the people for whom I'm working varies. There are a couple that are just like, oh my gosh, dude, that is so... It's all you talking but you talk differently for each character that you're supposed to be. And I'm like, yeah, the <laughs> fact that that su- surprises you depresses me <laughs> that, you know, you've never listened to an audiobook where a talented person is narrating. And, you know, I, I understand that there, there's, there are two schools of thought. There are people that are like, no, no, it's got to be like a textbook. It's got to be professionally done. The most important thing is that you understand every single word so that you can apply it towards your education. Sorry. But hopefully there are no people that actually feel that way. But then there are other people that are like, uh, you know, I don't like the way you said this. And it's like the, you take a breath in the middle of this sentence. You put the word only in this word a sentence, but I didn't put the word only and I was in the actual text. And I'm like, yeah, you also had typos. Should I have recorded those exactly as they are? It's been interesting. <laughs> The, the different level of uh, expectations from some of these people. And I think I, I mentioned in the episode where I talked about this, that it was just, it was nigh unto impossible to please this agent. And when I finally did, uh, I almost said, please her, but I didn't do that. When I finally got the thumbs up, the okay to go ahead, she still had to add that, yeah, you know, it's not, it's not professional quality, you know, but at this point, I mean, it's like, you know, I'm worried that, that it's not going to pass QC and, you know, I'm, I'm looking out for you because, you know, it's just not up to par with what we're usually dealing with. And that was one of those things. I worked so much harder for those 
clients, if you want to say, or partners or whatever than I did with others. But for the most part, people are just like, wow, you're really good at this. And you made my work. You made my writing sound really good. And maybe that's the difference between dealing with an author and dealing with an author's agent. The agent doesn't have an emotional connection to these characters and to these words like an author does. The agent doesn't care how much emotion you put into it. He or she cares about the background hiss or the, you know, I, I, the breath that you took in the middle of a sentence kind of thing. And so that's been a real lear- learning curve for me, too, of just discovering what I, yeah, I'll just say what I can get away with. <laughs> I guess uh, there was there's one that I'm working on where there's supposed to be like a supernatural being in the story. And if it were for the Dune Steef, I would put some kind of reverb or I'd put something, some this scary drone or some kind of effect <laughs> underneath those lines. But I don't know if I can do that or not for a real audiobook. I mean, part of me is just like, F it, dude. I've been doing this for years. Do what sounds best. If a ghost sounds better with a hissy reverb of when it's talking or whatever, then by all means do it because it's going to make the end result better. It's going to make it scarier or whatever. But another part of me says, you know, I've never heard that in an audiobook. Yeah, it depends on and the school of thought. I think it depends on what your client wants. You know, maybe you should ask them, hey, can I do this? Or uh, do I just need to leave it plain? If you ask me... A, they generally don't do it, and B, it's more work. So maybe you should just let it go. <laughs> it's more work, but it it's a tool that you and I have developed doing the Dune Steef, like the panel that we talked about at the New Media Expo of tricks that we've learned that work for comedy. Mm-hmm. I mean, those same tricks, except for the accent ones, work for sci-fi and horror as well. Right. Just the things that we've learned either by accident or by design that make things scarier or like, you know, when a chorus of people are talking, sometimes it's just you and me, but we double or treble that chorus. And it sounds like there's a bunch of people. I don't know what I'd do if there was a chorus of people talking in an audiobook that I was required to narrate. I guess my fear is that somebody's going to say this is unprofessional, but what the truth is, is I've never heard it in an audiobook, so I'm thinking it has to be a cookie-cutter match of all the other audiobooks I've ever heard. I mean, if you heard a Stephen King audiobook of The Shining or something, and every time one of the ghosts spoke, you knew it was a ghost because of the reverb or whatever, would that not sell the the, the horror more? I, I, and and that maybe that's a rhetorical question, because somebody talented enough... a uh, a Frank Muller, I guess, can convey that through his voice, but it just seems like there's one more tool in my arsenal that I could use, but you're saying that I can't. Did I mix metaphors there? I don't think they put tools in arsenals. <laughs> I think weapons go in arsenals and tools just go in toolboxes. Anyhow, I'm just, I was trying to make the connection between the clients, so to speak, that I'm dealing with with the audiobook thing and the clients that yeah. you would have dealt with. It with probably the is pretty beer. similar. And uh, maybe someday you may find that, uh, like you were saying, you know, a month down the line, you've gotten this much better. And six months down the line, you know, it's second nature. You just do it exactly how it's supposed to be without any trouble. And you just cruise along and you can do a book a week or whatever. Or maybe you will find that you would just rather kill yourself and keep doing this because these people are impossible to please and it's author zilla every time that you you know one out of ten or one out of five or whatever where they're like this is my baby i wrote this one book and it's the only book i've ever written and i probably will never write another so if it's not absolutely 100 percent perfect then i will i will not like it and i will stamp my little feet and i will not like <laughs> you know you may get you may, you know, we'll see what experience brings you, whether it's something where you just say, screw it, or you're something where you're just like, no, nah, it's easy. Um, my confidence level that I went into this with is now equaled by my skill <laughs> in putting it all together. We have been doing audio in this way. Oh, let me, I have been doing audio in this way for, you know, a decade now, for over 10 years. 
And yeah, if I listened to something that I made in 2003 or 2001, I'm sure it would be absolute shite to listen to, mostly because I didn't know about removing noise and, you know, have a much better microphone and right. things like that in those days. You just in use the, the on the, the built in microphone to your computer and. For the Dune Steve, we answer to ourselves. And there are probably a hundred episodes, or sorry, 10 episodes, where we say, I hope that the author likes the way what we did with this, but we're not answering to anyone. It's us and whatever our quality level, whatever bar we have set, that's what we're measured against. And so it's hard for me to humble myself in a way <laughs> for these things. You know, when somebody says that they don't like something that the way that it was done, or that's hard for me to hear. But at the same time, yeah, I don't know how audiobooks work. The only peers I have to ask are Renee and Brian, and they haven't been doing it for years and years either. But when there's a typo or when there's a grammatical error in the text, I fix it because that's what I did as an editor for the Dune Steve. And technically, I may not, I shouldn't, I, I might not be allowed to do that. If there are things I don't want to read, like, you know, other works by L. Ron Hubbard include, I don't read that part, but I don't know if I'm breaking a rule, if I'm supposed to read the entire text, you know, from beginning to end, including whatever is after the story. So yeah, I, I, I could be wrong on that, but it's just, I, who do I ask? And, and, and I don't know, maybe the answer is that you call somebody and you ask them the question, but like, if there's a word that I don't know how to pronounce because it's a fantasy novel or whatever. My options, my two options are stop the recording for a day at least and ask, send the email to the author or the author's agent and ask how to pronounce this word or do the best I can and just continue reading. And what is the correct answer? One of them wastes an unbelievable amount of time and or m momentum. Another one, I mispronounced that word intentionally <laughs> but, and, but the other you know but the other uh, potentially irritates the author or whatever and and renee talked about that she's like that there were a bunch of streets in new york or buildings or whatever and she had to find out how they were actually pronounced because she was supposed to be a new yorker and it, it would totally take you out of the story if a new yorker said something wrong in a way that you know said said a word in a californian way so I'm sorry, were, were these rhetorical questions or do you have an answer for any of the things that I've said? You had questions? Yeah. If if there's a word I don't know how to pronounce, oh. do I stop the recording and ask the author and wait a whole day to find out? I don't know. What we've often done, and for the most part it's worked for us, is you just try and come up with, okay, this word could be pronounced Siohar, could be pronounced Chiohar. It could be pronounced Ky Kyohar. Not that one. It we never yeah, we never came up with that one, sadly. But there was lots of ways that, for example, and then the word was spelled C-I-O-H-A-R. And we came up with as many ways that we could think of to pronounce that word. And we said that we did it with all of them. And then we sent off the message to the author saying, hey, how do you pronounce this, by the way? And then he sent us a thing back saying, oh, it's pronounced this way. And we thought, oh, my, how do you get that out of this? You've got to be kidding me. But, uh, you know, for the most part, and there's been lots and lots of stories where we had words that we've come across and we're like, okay, this is a made-up word. And we say it three or four different ways. And then we find out later, okay, it's pronounced this way. And so that's what we use when we edit it down. A made-up word like McEwen. Right. <laughs> that was one of those. We still, I don't think, get it quite right. But anyways... Yeah, you know, you got that option that you can do, or you, but it depends. I mean, if it's something that comes up once a page and you have to say all your options, you know, you have to say 10 different options of how to pronounce a word, then maybe that's not the best way to do it. But I don't know. I mean, there is, uh, like I've listened to the audio versions of Robert Jordan's Wheel of Times books. Some of them anyways, not all of them, but... In the back of his novels, he has a glossary where he defines 
all of you know he, he lists out the various characters he says what they're you know how you should remember them what they're like it's basically you know i mean it's a glossary of all this stuff that he made up and with this glossary is pronunciations it's in little brackets and it's you know one of those it's phon- phonetic phonetic or it's yeah so that we can actually it's not like the symbols kind oh. of, it doesn't have schwas and things like that in there it's uh give me a word that would be needed a pronunciation kind of a thing malachor is it okay malachor is the character's name so it would have mal dash a u h a dash and then core c o r e written in caps because this is the stressed syllable core mal a uh, core in brackets next to the name and then definition or whatever of this thing it has this for all the characters in the back of the book i've listened to the audiobook they didn't use the pronunciation that was in the glossary for the various characters why i have no idea but i'm just saying obviously if this is robert jordan who's one of the highest selling authors in fantasy that's how his audiobook comes out. Maybe just what you do is you do the best you can. Maybe those people didn't have those glossaries when they produced the uh, audio. Or maybe they didn't know there was a glossary at the end of the book that gave them all the pronunciations and so they didn't check it. You know, they had two readers. They had a female reader and the male reader doing the various chapters. If it was, you know, whoever the point of view character was, if it was a female, then the female would read that chapter. But she'd read the whole chapter, including the male dialogue? She would, yes. Okay. Um, But sometimes she would pronounce the character name one way, and the male reader would pronounce it a different way. How how did you listen to that? That would be a deal breaker for me, I think. It was a little frustrating. Because it's hard enough to keep track of all these characters, these outlandish names in your head, if they're pronounced the same all the time. Right. But usually it wasn't somebody that was a big deal. You know, so you didn't hear it pronounced differently very often was basically the way you deal with it. But uh, yeah, I mean, that happens. And that happened on a very professional, high, one of the higher selling fantasy. I mean, I don't know what kind of numbers fantasy novelists get versus thriller novelists or something like that. But Thriller was the biggest selling album of all time, after all. <laughs> Anyways, you know, I, I, maybe that's just the way you do it. You just do your best. You say, okay, it's probably Malachor. So I'm going to say it that way. And then you just go with that. Now, now, if the author afterward said, you didn't say Malachor's name correctly, how the hell do you fix that? You just tell him, okay, well, here's the deal. I can go back through and I can say his name right, but it's going to sound terrible if I do that. You need to get over it. <laughs> I don't know. You, you probably that's the best way to deal with it. Is just say, hey, you know, it can't be fixed now. If you wanted it to say Malachor, you needed to tell me that before we started. And maybe that's something else that you should do before you that's start. That's scary. Well, I, I say, hey, are there any weird names or any weird words that I need to know how to pronounce? Because if you don't tell me now, I'm just going to do my best. And you get stuck with what you get. I did stop today. And just stopped the recording and, and sent her an email and said, okay, these are the words. How do you want this, 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 this? And and if she doesn't respond, I don't know what to do. She gets half the money that comes in for this audiobook, ostensibly. I mean, I don't know how it really works yet. Um, so it's in her best interest to get back to me as soon as possible so that money can start rolling in. I mean, she's done all of her work but I ask a little bit more (laughs) at this point. But the other thing that I may do that I shouldn't do is when a character whispers something, I whisper. And when a character shouts something, I shout. And 80% of audiobooks, that's a big chunk of the ones I've heard. They do not do either of those things. You know, it's like, get out of my room, he shouted. Come back here, she whispered. I'm sure they're afraid of the being too loud or being too quiet. Right. right. But, you know, I come from an acting background. If it's a shout, I'm going to shout. I, I I don't know. I haven't, that hasn't bit me yet, but it, it may. And I just, I know that it's a different discipline than actual acting, than what we do on the Steef is. It's a different world than where you come from. What we're doing on the Steef is a, a crossbreed between audiobook and audio drama. Right. Did that exist before we did it? 
<laughs> was there such a thing as full cast audio? We invented it. No, there's a few people that were doing similar things, but where I never heard that before. We there started. was this show. A lot of people talk about uh, as being the first one where they heard full cast. I didn't hear it until well after our show had started and was already doing that. But uh, the show was called, I think, Metamore City. Hmm. And I think it started a little bit before our show. And I think there may have been does, a couple. Does that still, of, does that like, still exist? I don't know. You know, I do remember people talking about Metamorcy. I didn't know it was full cast, and and I didn't hear the term full cast. Yeah, it was until, a well I, it after. must have been Abby and Brian that introduced that to me, right? I, yeah, I'm where not else sure would when we I have heard. heard it? I think I may have heard it before they started their show, but I think I probably heard it out of Abby's mouth first. Yeah, that and Shelt. Yeah, the things I heard. I did hear that first out of Abby's <laughs> mouth as well. I have had a couple headaches on it. And it has been a little bit of an irritant to have to edit. And there are noises that my mouth makes that I don't realize that it makes. I'll say. Until you're listening to it. And then it's worse. Just now I've started listening to everything with headphones on. And it's not the little earbud things that are all I listen to anything in. I got the big headphones that cover your ears. Oh, nice. And Fancy. there's all sorts of noises and the chair moving and, you know, just the heater coming on on the other end of the room and things that are picked up that I never would have heard otherwise without the headphones on. And, and that has made me not paranoid, but pickier, I guess, of, oh, shoot, I wonder if somebody could hear my breath and all that. And again, each client cares in a different way about that sort of stuff. Right. I put like a sigh in one of mine. And then I specifically emailed the author and said, hey, I sighed in this. And I know that there are people that say you do not sigh in audiobooks, but there were also people that said it's wrong for a woman to vote and learn to read. So let me know if you'd like me to take the sigh out. And she said, oh, no, I thought it was great. Did you ever try uh, recording with the blanket over your head like I was saying that one time just to see how it sounded? I didn't. I I mean, I think what's making the most noise is the actual fan of the computer. What the 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 hard drive? What did they used uh -huh. to call those? The tower. The tower box. Eventually, I've got to get a new computer because mine is uh, almost as old as yours, you could. and it's it's uh, it's antiquated. And I've got a giant forty pound monitor, you know, that I got <laughs> in two thousand and two. And, you and, could try getting one of those little H2N ones or whatever the H2N or whatever it is. You have to get the, the virus shot for them. Yeah, yeah, that you just plug your mic into and then you could record it without the computer. I don't know if you could print out your stuff, but then you could record it without the computer being on so the fan doesn't make noise because it's not on. But yeah, I, I, I'm interested. I'm, I've still never tried that. But, you know, Renee talked about her tent that yeah. she constructed that she recorded stuff in. And I remember way back when we were about to start this podcast, there was a third guy that I was actually going to try and include in the show. Um, and he was the voice of Daryl? No. D From the very first the story. The very first story. What was the the I cool thought you and guys, I did those voices. The cool guy's voice. I was narrator. You were nerdy guy. And then this third guy was what was the name of the the cool character the something with a d scott yeah probably that uh, probably steve <laughs> um anyways he was the voice of that guy and he was i was actually going to try and get him in on the show as well i don't know if it would have worked out uh he used to work with me at the time and he was talking he had done when he went to college he went to college for radio so he wasted his time way worse than we did in college um but anyways, he uh, he was saying, oh, yeah, you know, I, uh, he was talking about constructing a kind of like a tent that you could record in, which would be basically be a really cheap recording booth. Um, and it was kind of, you know, getting poles and, you know, getting a blanket wrapped around it and uh, recording inside of that. When I was in college, we had a set of things. They were they were wooden but they were on little wheels, so you could open them up, and the, you would put the mic in there, and then you would push them back together, and they had the foam stuff, that egg That's crate right. foam I recorded stuff. a couple of things in that for films that we yeah, did. Yeah, we had that thing, which was sort of like the same kind of a deal. It was like a tent. It didn't 
have a ceiling on it, so it, there was still probably a tiny bit of reverberation that you still picked up. But uh, yeah, I mean, that was just, I don't know, it'd be interesting to see if you could improve your sound by doing some of those kind of things. Just, you know, I would think if you took a, pair, a piece of plywood, cut a square on it, got yourself a, a two by two and put a nail through the bottom of the plywood into the two by two, then you'd have a stand basically. And then you could, you know, maybe staple a blanket onto one of them have four of these things, wrap the blanket around the four corners and then hook it on the other end. And then you've got a impromptu tent that you could assemble each time you needed to record. You take your little H2 or whatever they're called, Zoom thing into that tent with you. And then you just record inside there and read. And there would probably be very little sound that you would have to reduce if you did something like that. But, uh, you know, those are things to look into as you uh, continue along your journey and try stuff out. This ended up being a very long episode, didn't it? Yeah, and we never even got to what we were actually going to talk about. We had plans to talk about some kind of Star Wars related thing. Uh, well, I'm I mean, sorry. Do you think people were bored out of their minds? <laughs> That's possible. I think there's always the possibility of that happening on any one of our episodes, though. <laughs> That's a good point. Well, then let's let them go their way. I'll... Uh... I'm not going to apologize, but uh, maybe we'll have something more interesting to talk about next week. We did complain a little bit about wedding videos. There you go. Or I did, at least. Oh, okay. Uh, let me finish with this. Uh, if uh, about an hour ago when we were talking about doing another marathon, uh, any listener has topics that they'd like us to talk about, that would be fun if you want to just put them in the comments or go into the forums or something like that. Um, it would be really neat if I was like, okay, hey, the so-and-so wants us to talk about the ladybug, ladybug, fly away home nursery rhyme. So we're going to talk about that. Uh, yeah, I, I'm sorry, that just came oh, out of nowhere. Oh, man. That's good because I, I did a 10-page paper on that. I'm sure you did. Uh, just for fun this last weekend. So I, I'm, I'm prepared for this ladybug, ladybug, fly away home episode. It's going to be good. Uh, I, I'm expecting to, to hear a, a scary drone under all of this. What? I, I, and for a moment, I actually believed you. All right. Hey, thank you for listening. I have been Rish Outfield. And I'm Big Anglovich. See you later, folks. Hey, your mountain is waiting. Oh, your mountain is waiting. So get on your way. Why not? That gets my go is produced under a Creative Commons 3.0 license. Today's show sucked more than usual. Not more than usual. Uh -huh. Oh, you're trying to face me? Now my stand is falling over. Face me like a man, you... Single berry. Move this closer because the headphones don't reach. Ah, and you're listening to headphones to make sure there's no distortion or to make sure I don't say something funny. It's always important to monitor the recording because there have been times when we didn't monitor it and then not always did we regret it, but there were times that we did. If every recording session went as planned, how many more episodes would we have than we do right now? Probably 10 more, I would bet. That's probably how many we've had that are FUBAR. Folks, please donate to the show. We will use it to buy a time machine and go back. So uh, because of your donations, there will be 136 episodes instead of 126 episodes of the show. <laughs> but if, the, if you're listening to this and there are 136 episodes, it's up to you to donate to make sure that that was your donation that enabled us to do that. There you go.